Well, thank you, Janet, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today for the latest in our series of webinars sponsored by the Nanotechnology Collaborative Infrastructure Southwest and the NAC Network. So my name is Trevor Thornton, representing NCISW, and I'm helped today by Bob Ehrman from NAC out at Penn State, and he'll be helping us field any questions that people might want to add uh, to the online chat room. And it's a pleasure to welcome today Dr. Christiana Hansberg, Chris, and I'm looking forward to finding out where my flying car is, so why don't I hand over to you. Okay, thank you Trevor. Solar energy has uh, made dramatic strides in the last several years, and there are lots of questions on how are we going to handle the energy transition? What is possible? What's not possible? What should we be doing? And so what I want to go over in the seminar today is what can we learn from other energy transitions, and what is the potential of solar energy in the long term? So let's go to the next slide. And when we, um, oh. and I should jump here because I neglected to introduce Chris as the director of our Quest Engineering Research Center. This is funded by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, and it's to address the terawatt challenge, which is something that Chris is going to explain to us as she progresses through the talk. So Chris, let me hand back to you. Okay, thank you. So let's go to the next slide again. So the energy infrastructure is one of the largest overall infrastructures in the world today. So if we look at the total amount of energy that's used by the world in one year, it's in the range of peta, uh, peta kilowatt hour. So a huge amount of energy usage and that implies a very large infrastructure. That infrastructure is undergoing dramatic changes. This started in the last decade or so as the price of renewables started to decrease. And what I want to look at is how will the technology shape the energy system in the future and what can we do to, what's an optimal way for us to manage this energy transition. Let's go to the next slide. So, so if we look at some of the previous energy transition or some of the previous technology transitions that we've seen in the last hundred years or so, we can get an insight into what are the limits and what can we do to make that transition go in a smooth fashion. One of the major technology transitions that we've encountered recently is in transportation. And of course, transportation is also a very large infrastructure and has many parallels to the overall energy systems. So about 100 years ago, or maybe now about 150 years ago, the technology, or sorry, the uh, transportation system was largely done by horses. So this picture right here shows the Easter Parade in New York, and you can see uh, that nearly all the transportation was either walking or horse-drawn carriages. Next slide. The horses had a substantial environmental impact, so that there's a quota, or there were many, many articles at the turn of the century at that time saying that the, uh, basically the, the output of the horses was causing enormous environmental problems. So the quote here is that by 1950, every street in the city would be buried nine feet deep in horse manure, and there was many apocalyptic articles saying, we don't know what to do, there's no other technology, it's uh, having health impacts, the whole, system, the whole infrastructure is going to collapse. Of course, today we do not have this problem. Let's go to the next slide. And as everyone knows, that the car and the streetcar, both um, electric and gasoline or, or fuels, came in and started to displace the horse-drawn carriages. So this is an example where there were 
many environmental impacts of the present system, and the scale of those environmental impacts led to the search for uh, new technologies and a technology transition. Next slide, please. So we are presently undergoing a similar or very parallel set of circumstances in the energy system infrastructure. So in 1995, um, there was a famous paper by Professor Smiley, who uh, was also a Nobel laureate, and he published a paper saying that there was a terawatt challenge. Now, in the first slide, we were talking about uh, we had terawatts on there. Terawatt is 10 to the 12 watts. Um, and presently, the world today has a uses a constant amount of assume that we have about 10 terawatts of installed capacity. We need that to power the world. There are a couple of interesting things from the paper. Um, one is just the scale of the problem. So again, we have to develop an energy system relatively fast that is on the terawatt scale. There is also the issue that um, the energy system impacts many, many things, everything, water, food, poverty. It is a driver in just about all the major social implications that we have today. A, another factor that he pointed out is that he anticipated that this would be extremely slow. So that uh, one of the key challenges was that we needed to do it fast, but he was in, uh, saying that um, there is presently no technology that was economically um, uh, sustainable or economically, technologically, and socially sustainable. So what do we do? So let's go to the next slide. Now in the 20 years since he published that paper, there have been exponential increases in both photovoltaics and in wind energy. And this slide right here looks at the increases in photovoltaics only. The two blue lines on the slide show the annual installed photovoltaic capacity, and the upper lighter blue one is the cumulative installed capacity. Now, what's interesting about this, in, or about really any exponential growth, is that as we look for how this is going to progress, if we assume continued rapid installation in photovoltaics, then we see that we are going to be able to make a difference to the terawatt challenge in, the, in a relatively short amount of time. So as an example of this, if we look at the annual installed capacity, where the annual installed capacity of photovoltaics intersects with the annual energy needs, either of the US, which is the bottom red line, or of the world, which is the bottom green line, then we see that just from a energy or from a total amount of energy standpoint, we do not need to install any technology other than photovoltaics to meet the US annual in electricity needs um, or the new electricity needs. Now, of course, other countries than the US install, so but nevertheless, it shows that, let's say, in the 2030 year or the 2030 time frame, that the continued exponential growth of photovoltaics enables photovoltaics to become a significant or dominant rural energy space. Let's go to the next slide. So the, this is going to be a really substantial change in how we use and view energy. So this slide right here showed, is a very famous picture showing the Earth at night. And this picture has become proxy for the electricity use of countries. And you can see that the, 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 the picture from space at night correlates with population centers and energy use. Let's go to the next slide. And then let's go to, the, again, the next slide to start the animation. So this right here is a, again, looking at the map of the US, but the, what you see is the number of PV installations. So when we look at this now, we see that there's a, that rather than having a map which shows 
the detrimental energy usage, we can now show that we also are generating a huge amount of electricity from photovoltaics, so that we're seeing extremely good correlation with how we use energy and where, where we generate electricity. Let's go to the next slide. And looking at this in a little bit more numerically, what this present state of the PV industry is, is that you can see the rapid and exponential growth of photovoltaics. And so presently in the world, there's about 200 gigawatts peak of uh, installed photovoltaic capacity. So this actually shows that um, even though the PV has been undergoing rapid installation only for let's say one to two decades, um, we are already at 0.2 terawatts of that terawatt challenge. So in about 20 years, we've managed to go from nearly nothing to starting to really make a difference. Some countries are actually starting to actually see a substantial amount of photovoltaics as a fraction of their total electricity usage. So on the left, we have some of the leaders in that area. So Italy presently gets about 8% of its total electricity usage from photovoltaics. Germany is there at 7.1%. Of course, Germany has been, an, has been a leader in installing photovoltaics, but Germany also has the solar radiation of about Alaska. And so even though they have a very large installation, their impact on their total electricity has been a little bit smaller. Let's go to the next slide. The dominant, there are two types of technology dominant in the photovoltaic industry today. The first one is silicon, and silicon makes up about 90% of the industry. It is, uh, the upper picture shows a typical silicon module, um, and you can see that those little white squares are each an individual solar cell. The remainder, or nearly all of the remainder of the industry is thin film. That's a mixture of cadmium telluride and sinks. They are very heavily used in utility scale, and so the bottom picture there is an image of some of the CADTEL systems being used in a utility scale. Yes, maybe this is a good segue to a question that Bob just posted. What is the, where is the U.S. in PV percentage? It varies quite widely from state to state. California has put the most photovoltaics in of any state. California is above 10% of their total electricity usage is um, from photovoltaics. The overall average for the U.S. is 1.3%. Oh, so overall we're still lagging behind countries like Germany and Italy. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, but part of that, is, is, so the U.S. is actually quite big and the southern or the high radiation states tend to have a fair amount of PV and the northwest um, doesn't have so much solar radiation. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So just uh, still also going in terms of the photovoltaic efficiency, we are in terms of the state of the market. Photovoltaics has made very large changes in or very large increases in its installed capacity, but the upper left image shows the efficiency and the technological state of the present photovoltaics. So if we look at, let's say, the light blue bar that shows that there's a number next to it, 19.2, so that is the typical module efficiency of a, of a dominant silicon technology. The dark, the dark, I guess, copper colored bar on the top shows the record photovoltaic silicon efficiency is at 25.6. And you can see that those are there's the other technologies. There's variations in the number, but they're all below for a flat plate technology about 25-26%. The plot on the lower right shows the possible efficiencies. And you can see that the scale on that is dramatically different. It, uh, I, I kept this scale at 70%, but the maximum efficiency, you can see some of the numbers there going off the, off the top of the scale, the maximum efficiency is 86%. 
So there is a huge difference in what is thermodynamically possible and what we achieve today. This is quite interesting because existing power plants run very, very close to their optimum efficiency. So for a thermal coal plant, the um, maximum possible efficiency is on the order of, let's say, 30%. And they run very, very close to that. They run at about, let's say, 29% or so. So that is suggesting that there is enormous room to, for photovoltaics to still continue to expand. But the question is, how do we do that? The photovoltaic, this number of 25.6 has not changed substantially in the last 50 years. So we hit a 20% solar cell in, let's say, the 1970s. And today, we're at 25.6. So we need a new approach. And the um, part of the little bit later in the talk, we'll go through what we can do about that. OK, let's go through the next slide. While we wait for the next slide, somebody, Bob has posted another question. I'm not sure whether Chris could address it now, but uh, you're asking how much, in, we showed the installed solar capacity, but how much of that contributes to the grid? Is that something that we know? Yes, the uh, amount of off-grid installed solar, um, so certainly the off-grid was the dominant market up until, let's say, the 80s. That was um, the off-grid and space markets were dominant until then. Today, the off-grid market is a very small fraction, under half a percent of the total market. So we say when we say installed solar capacity, all but a fraction of a percent contributes to the grid. And here's a nice example of what we're doing at ASU in that regard. The, this is interesting for, um, for the US context in that previously we mentioned that Germany had been installing solar for a long time, but still was at 7.1%. And previously I gave the number that California, which has not been doing it as long, is already over 10%. And in high solar insulation, and the US actually has extremely high solar insulation compared to many countries, it um, really shows how rapidly you can do this. So ASU started installing systems in about, or started doing a large number of systems in around the 2009 time frame. Today, ASU has a total of um, about 25 megawatts installed. That's about the same amount as San Francisco. More than 50% of the peak electricity is supplied by PV, and 20%, roughly 20% of all of ASU's total electricity is supplied by photovoltaics. So in regions with high solar radiation, this is about, let's say, uh, less than a decade. We've gone from nothing to over 20% of the total electricity. OK, so let's go to the next slide. So before we go on to what can we do to have substantially new technologies, one of what I want to go through now is that um, very often we get asked on about a lot of questions. OK, photovoltaics has been growing rapidly. Its efficiency is now at about 20%. It's cost effective in nearly in about, uh, let's say, 45 of the 50 US states. So what I want to go through now is just really briefly um, some of the sort of PV myths or what do we do about some of these issues. One question that we get asked quite a bit is, well, OK, what about the energy payback time? And the energy payback time is, um, varies from less than one year to two years, depending about uh, the amount of sun at a particular location. So of course, if you make a PV module and store it in your garage where it gets no sun, then the energy payback time is quite large. If you put it on a roof in Arizona, the energy payback time is less than a year. If you put it in on average, taking the average solar radiation for Europe and the US, it's about one and a half years. Uh, another question that we get asked a very large amount is what about land use? And the short answer to this is that many of the energy technologies have very similar land use areas. This is really just an economic driver. Land is a substantial fraction of the total balance of systems costs, and no energy technology that has too uh, low of a power density will be economic. 
We compare the solar land use to nuclear, not because the two technologies are similar, but because there is extremely good data sets on how much um, on the defined land use for the nuclear power plants. And it turns out that nuclear gives you about, has about a factor of close to twice the energy density of solar. But that's quite location dependent. In the southeast, you're actually better off taking your land area from a nuclear plant and putting solar everywhere. In the northwest, it would be an extremely bad idea. Um, go through some of these others very quickly. The energy density of solar is about the same of uranium. You also often get asked about material availability. Um, for silicon is one of the, the highest material or highest uh, material concentrations in the earth crust. The first limitation that you're going to hit is the silver in, you know, if you look at a PV cell, there's a, sort of these metal lines on top. That has a substantial fraction of silver in it. Um, we can get up to a yearly installation rate of 2 terawatts. And when we start getting to 2 terawatts, we start having to slightly cut into the, next, uh, to the largest consumer market, which is as microbial agents and things like socks and so on and so forth. Now, that's not really a, a fundamental material limitation. Of course, uh, copper is a better conductor, and already some technologies are shifting to copper. But right now, there's just not really the economic or materials incentive to shift from silver. Uh, let's go to the, unless there's uh, other questions on this, let's go to one of the next issues that is continuously brought up about solar. And this is conventionally known as duck curves. And so this image right here is from the, the Casio generating in California. And what it shows is simulation data for the possibility of the worst day of the year, um, which in California is in early spring. So the dark blue line is the present electricity uh, usage profile. You can see that on this particular day, it's relatively flat. And this is, of course, because it's in spring. There's no air conditioning loads or anything like that. It's relatively flat. And then the electricity usage goes up at night when people come home and turn on the lights and the microwave and TVs and so on and so forth. Now, as solar is generating during the day, what happens is the load during the day goes down. You can see that from the dark, um, the dark brown lines. But the solar stops generating at night, so the peak actually is the same. And that means that utilities have to go from a low amount of generation capacity to a very high amount of generation capacity in a relatively short time frame. Now, this right here places some um, economic pressure on photovoltaics. So um, you can occasionally not use photovoltaics if your generation capacity of photovoltaic gets too high. But the short version of this quite complex issue is that people know how to get around it, but it does require um, an additional, let's say, 10%, 10 to 20% reduction in the price of photovoltaics. OK, so let's move on to the next slide. Uh, let's go through, I, I don't think people need the ra exact ramp numbers for the utility, so let's move on again. OK, so what I've done up till now is given you a bit of a state of the industry. And we've made huge progress in photovoltaics. But the central point is that the present technology, which is pictorially represented on the right, is actually still at a, its early infancy in its development. So right now, we're making solar cells that are the equivalent of a Model T. And so we want to know, we want to get some kind of idea of what should we be for in the next 20-year uh, time frame or so. OK, let's go to the next slide. So what we want to know is how will, first of all, is there a room for photovoltaics to continue to develop and meet these exponential 
um, growth rates that we need. And so one of the questions we often get asked for that, is there a Moore's Law for photovoltaics? And Moore's Law was a, is an extremely famous representation that for many semiconductor technologies, both the cost and the performance are related to a technologically controlled parameter. So this means that as technology improves, we, get, we make it both cheaper and higher performance. In transistors, of course, the, that parameter is the, gate, um, is the gate length. Solar cells are actually volumetric devices. We absorb light in the entire volume of the material. The cost is also very strongly related to the material volume. In fact, a substantial reason that solar cells have come down in price so much is that the polysilicon prices um, have come down by a factor of 10 or so. So this means that in order to, that there is a Moore's Law for photovoltaics, and in order to capitalize it, we need to get much thinner than we are today. So if we continue to go down in thickness, then we can still stay on the Moore's Law. So let's go to the next slide. So if we're going to start to make um, improvements, what are the what are the avenues for? How can we really move from, let's say, this 25% limit to, a, to sort of the more thermodynamic limits? And the overall thing that we are going to do is that nanotechnology is an extremely important part of that. And we use nanotechnology for the optical control, so controlling how light enters the solar cell. We use uh, nanostructures for controlling the electronic band structure. And then we can use nanostructures to access some fundamentally new physics that we haven't seen before. So let's start out with optical control. So presently, a solar cell is designed to accept light from every single portion of the sky. Now, this is actually uh, interesting. Let's go to the next slide. Because we, most solar cells, or humans in fact, don't actually see the horizon. You are limited, you, even though there is some light coming from it, it's usually blocked by buildings, trees, mountains, whatever. So thermodynamically, if we are designing the solar cell to absorb light from all regions of the sky, they just have a lower thermodynamic limit than if we um, have a narrower acceptance angle. So what we do is design our solar cell to not accept light from the sky where we don't get any light anyway. So let's go on to the next slide. So this means that going rather than moving from the 90 degree half angle acceptance or 180 degree acceptance angle that's in the bottom right labeled 90%, we can move up to let's say the one in red which gives us a theoretical performance of above, we can get above 30%. But what's actually probably more interesting is that we go from an optimum thickness of more than 100 microns, we reduce that by a factor of 50 or more. So we increase our efficiency and we drop the materials usage by a factor of 50. So again, higher efficiency, and lower material costs right at, at the same time. So then the question is, how might we go about doing that? So let's go to the next slide. And so the key way that we might go about doing that, or the key way we go about doing that is nanostructures. So this right here is an image of a nanostructured silicon surface. So what we do is we um, can spin silica nanospheres over the entire surface of the silicon and that's shown in the bottom right. And then we use the silica nanospheres as a etching mask, and then we can make over the entire four or six inch surface of the silicon, we can make these uh, nanostructured rods. And we can control the surface morphology using a low cost, large area process. And this very nanostructured surface allows us to achieve that, um, the better optical control that I talked about in the previous slide. Let's go on to the next slide. 
Um, again, let's go on to the next one. So then we had some discussion of what we can do to control the light entering the solar cell. And now that, that gives us some efficiency increase and gives us dramatically thinner devices. What we can also do is access a quite substantial efficiency increases by um, going to a control of the electronic states in a material. So what we do in this is we put quantum dots in a solar cell and the quantum dots give us a range of operation that is, that is um, called multiple quasi-Fermi levels. Sorry, I couldn't resist saying quasi-Fermi levels in a, in a talk. And, but what's interesting in that is that just about every modern semiconductor device today has many, many different energy levels in it, but only every device only has a single quasi or a dominant single quasi-Fermi se separation. So essentially, this allows us to take semiconductors to the next stage. So semiconductors give us a huge amount of performance uh, or new devices um, because we could control the type of carriers in it. Now, not only can we control the type of carriers, but we can get multiple carrier populations at the same region. This gives us a factor of three increase in efficiency as well as giving us a whole range of other interesting devices such as um, dramatically more efficient LEDs, so on and so forth. So Chris, if I look at this picture, uh, am I right in thinking that the innovation here is that at the moment we really just use one wavelength of light, but this approach with quantum dots allows us to extract energy from other wavelengths? That's exactly right. So largely the efficiency of a existing um, what's called single material or conventional material is let's say about 20, let's say about 25 percent and that's because it's efficient only at uh, a very narrow band of wavelengths and all the other uh, wavelengths are either not absorbed or are used relatively inefficiently. So in this case, or in this example right here, we can use three wavelengths of light very efficiently, so that roughly triples the efficiency that we can do. So next slide. What's interesting is that with um, some nanostructures, we can actually access even uh, more interesting physics, and we can actually start um, developing uh, energy technology, energy devices that are fundamentally just entirely different from the operation of anything today. So this essentially means that we move from not only controlling the optical properties of the solar cells with nanostructures, as we saw with the uh, with the sort of rug-like thing that we saw earlier, or not just controlling the electronic states of it, but now we control how the, the heat transfer in the individual device goes. And this allows us to get to, let's say, that red line that's shown on the top. And this means that now in a single device, we can get to the very close um, to the thermodynamic limit. And these, can do, these optical conditions gave us 70%. But we can get all that we can access, whatever the thermodynamic limit is, we can get there. So let's go to the next part of this slide. So how might we do that? And again, that's all nanostructures. And I haven't shown the nanostructure explicitly. But the two plots of that diagram right there are two parts, one part of a quantum well and one part of a, a quantum dot. So that we then also start controlling not just how we move carriers, but how they interact with the uh, phonons and the heat flow in the material. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so if we were to summarize at this point, we'd say that thermodynamic tells us we are nowhere near the efficiency potential of any of the photovoltaic technologies, not the, not the conventional silicon solar cells, which we can use optical control, not the, we have not gotten, we have not um, capitalized on the materials or on the physics yet. So let's go to the next slide. 
So what then, if we're nowhere near the, the potential of photovoltaics, what can we say about how it's going to change in the future? And this is actually an interesting point because, um, of course, the, even though cars have been around for now, let's say, or have been viable as a commercial technology for more than 100 years, people still are, there's still advances in cars coming on, and cars have not really um, capitalized on their full potential. So we're looking for where do we, what's the end point that we want to get to? Let's go to the next part of this. So this is actually a very interesting look to see how do we want to, or on the need for innovation and continued um, advances in energy technology. So doing our transport analogy, so people, let's say, this is the, of course where we started out, we got horses. Let's go to the next part of this. If we want to go to a faster, um, we want to substantially improve what we can get out of horses, then the energy density of the input fuel for horses is just too low. They can't do it. So thermodynamically, if you look at the starting point of the horse and want to improve it, you end up with the uh, famous painting on the right there. Um, where horses need a higher energy density fuel. And of course this means that if you just blatantly look at thermodynamics, saying, all right, that's where we're starting, that's where we want to go, we end up with somewhere we actually really don't want to go. Let's go to the next one. I want to jump in there. So that picture, Chris, was showing flesh-eating horses, right? Yeah, because yes, it is. a grass-eating horse doesn't get enough energy to make a faster horse-drawn cart. That's right. And so that's a, that's a Greek from a painting about a Greek myth on that somebody was... Um, and interesting, even if we could make a flesh-eating horse, it's a very bad outcome, even if we get faster cars. Right. So uh, even if uh, so thermodynamic tells you you need higher energy density, but you probably don't want, or that's not the best route to uh, go to a flying car, which is actually a prototype is shown right here. So what we actually get from thermodynamics is that the, you do not want to take a linear starting point. You do not want to say, this is what our present lead technology, if we just take thermodynamics and improve it, um, that's not good enough. Let's go to the next slide. We need to have a lot more social and a lot more creativity and innovation in it. So the question sort of is, is, uh, is comes up is if we don't want flesh-eating horses, but we, um, what's the energy analogy of that? So what do we want to do? What's our actual end point that we want with a lot more solar energy? So, for example, if we install several terawatts, and again, that's not really, again, we're at 0.2 terawatts at the moment, so that's uh, certainly doable. We can extract and convert enough CO2 in the atmosphere to get back down to the um, levels suggested by, by the climate scientists. Let's go to the next point on this. Um, so, we could uh, go, although the polar bear looks actually quite happy eating his banana, he probably does want to be back on his uh, ice floe there. So let's go back to the uh, next point on this. Uh, another thing that we might be able to do with a dramatically expanded uh, energy technology is that 100 gigawatts, and so now this is actually a quite, quite doable range. Again, we're at uh, 200 gigawatts at the moment. Um, 100 gigawatts meets 70% of California water needs by desalinization. And the reason I did 70% is that they presently get about 30% of their water. They only need to replace 70% of their water. 30% of their water sources are, are, are fine at the moment. So again, this is a very doable. Um, with, if we have access to expanded energy technology, we can um, solve the water issues. Let's go on to the next point. Um, some of the more starting to move into sort of the more solving problems and getting to more creative use is that a lot of movies um, say that we want to start sending substantially 
So we want to send people into space. That is actually extremely energy intensive. If we want to send some, a re, even a reasonable fraction, like 1% of people into space, we need to access huge amounts of energy. And so this is bigger than, this is uh, on the order of, let's say, not, uh, again, doable, but on the order of 50 to 100 uh, terawatts. So let's go on to the next one. So essentially, what we what photovoltaic ends up allowing us to do is that we can really change the paradigm of energy use and conversion. We can not only do huge initiatives like sending people into space, but we can do very, we can essentially make energy ubiquitous. We can continuously monitor people's health. And so the first time you see, the, so even one cell showing up as a problem lets us intervene much earlier. So there is enormous potential both at the large scale and about making energy, really decoupling us, not viewing energy as just an outlet anymore. Let's go on to the next point. So essentially thermodynamically tells us, thermodynamics does, uh, is often used to say we are going to be limited at this and this spot. But really, if we look at thermodynamics more carefully, it tells us just about anything is possible. And really, to shape the future of this, we can see that we know technologically how we can get to some of the thermodynamic limits. But what we really need is to have a broader discussion about the energy issues. Where does society want to go? And what do we want to do with energy? And uh, I think I will end it at that. So thank you, everyone, very much. Well, thank you very much, Chris. There's a, there were a number of questions being typed by Bob that we didn't get a chance to address, but I think we have a few minutes left, and a number of them were related to the issue that you've told us that currently we're at that 20-25% efficiency for commercially installed PV solar systems. Mm -hmm. You showed that with a clever control of how we handle the light, how we handle the electricity, and how we handle the heat, mm -hmm. the thermodynamics can get us up to above 70 or 80 percent? That's correct. So the, thermodyna the ultimate thermodynamic limit is 86.6 uh, percent for the Earth. If you go to Venus, you get larger. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to go to Venus. But, so I thought this was interesting, your use of Moore's law as an analogy. Uh, for computer chips, everybody's worried about the end of Moore's Law coming up very soon. But I think what you're saying, Chris, is that the Moore's Law PV is really just beginning. That's right. We're just at the very, very start of it right now. And so the Moore's Law is a technological achievement. And I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? The thermodynamics tells us we can go close to 80%. Now it's the technology of how do we actually build things that will go from our current level of 20% up to those higher values. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, another good question here is about the uh, recycling of PV units. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a big part of what Chris's engineering research center is doing. So maybe to wrap up, Chris, you might spend a minute or two just telling us what Quest's vision is. OK. On, um, for the recycling or? Well, the recycling is a good start, but I know you cover all aspects of PV. Okay. Um, let me actually, before I answer that question, ask you to back up a slide. So we actually have, and um, I'll note that blue is very poor on a black background, but um, just to, if people want some more information on either any of the technical topics or some of the other issues, there's a, a website right there that um, gives some more information on it. Okay, so let me um, just take a, quest, a moment to answer the question on what Quest Vision is. So Quest is committed to developing novel technologies that can help us address the terawatt challenge. And the central takeaway from looking at some of the other energy transitions is that we want to design this and have a, a sustainable end point for it. And this means economically, socially, environmentally sustainable. So part of this then is technologically is going to higher efficiency, going to more rapidly scalable, but part of it is also about making sure that we don't harm the environment. 
For the solar cells, it's actually an interesting question because the for, so the I didn't go through some of the history, but the one of the first high efficiency silicon solar cells was made in 1954. That solar cell still exists, still has about the same efficiency. So the viable lifetime of the modules is actually quite long. This is good from one standpoint for recycling and is also quite interesting from another standpoint in that the recycling really has to be done by somebody other than, or the companies have to be involved in it, but they, the, it has to be done by something other than the companies because otherwise you're assuming that a company needs to have a 40 or 50 year lifetime to take the modules back. So, um, the, yeah, uh, probably, I could go on for recycling for a long time, but we'll probably leave it at that. And you have some, I, I would emphasize the website that Chris has on this slide, that, that there's a lot of resources there available to find out more about oh, TV yeah, in general. An it's about three or four hundred pages on it. Very significant. Uh, well, Chris, I think we're getting close to wrapping up. It's nice to end your talk on such a positive message. We hear a lot of doom and gloom about how the uh, planet is in danger, but I think the take-home message from what you're telling us is that we can address a lot of those problems by PV installation. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I was interested to see that we went all the way from nanotechnology, 10 to the minus 9, up to terawatts, 10 to the 12. So we're addressing huge length scales, and clearly nano has a big part to play. Uh, one quick, if you were king or queen, where would you invest in PV research? In what technical area? That's a good question. Um, so I think that the using our transport analogy again, that uh, the PV will diversify. So at the moment, it is similar to the Model T. There's one model available, and that's what everybody gets. So the answer, there's not a single answer to that. Technology will diversify. Each of the technologies will have a market. So really the question sort of comes back to, well, would you, if you were at the Model T stage, where would you invest? So clearly some people had very viable investments in large trucks. Some people have very viable investments in passenger vehicles. So there's a, not one answer to that. Well, very good. I think we're about to wrap up. So once again, thank you, Chris, for taking the time. A very fascinating and uplifting presentation. So with that, I'll hand over to Janet because she wants to tell us a little bit about the RAIN network. Actually, I think Bob is going to speak here. Yes, he is. But I know, Janet, you are actually going to, uh, you want people to stay on for a moment to uh, Please. fill out a questionnaire after I finish here. Um, the, speaking of nanotechnology, we heard a lot about a nanotechnology here, and I'm uh, actually a managing director of the NAC network, or nanotechnology applications and career knowledge, and we're partnered with uh, with Trevor uh, in Arizona, and uh, they are members of the Rain network. As is uh, Joe, who's on here now from North Seattle. We have a a group of uh, currently ten schools, um, uh, universities, and community colleges across the country who are providing remote access to instruments. Um, nanotechnology instruments such as scanning electron microscopes, scanning probe microscopes and, and the like uh, and many others. Um, and this is really used for outreach and, in, and uh, actually experiments into classrooms uh, at the K-12 to level as well as the community college level as well as at universities across the U.S. And our, our vision is to have uh, nodes of the, these uh, RAIN nodes all across the country. Um, and uh, it actually enables students to to access uh, equipment uh, in real time uh, to really try to stimulate their interest in, in uh, nanotechnology in particular, uh, careers in nanotechnology at all levels, uh, uh, technicians all, all the way to future PhDs, and also to um, show them that, uh, you know, show them this technology and, 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 and that this technology is embedded in other technologies also. So if you're interested in this, please go to our, our, our website, nanoforme.org, uh, and the uh, suffix there is remote access, slash remote access. Um, and I would, uh, you know, ask you to take a look at that and go to our website and uh, just wanted to put that in there. Um, thank you. And Janet? Thank you very much. Okay, well, 
um, I would just like to remind everybody that today's webinar has been recorded and webinar recording recordings and slides uh, will be available post webinar within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, they'll also be posted on the NAC, nanoforme.org and NCI Southwest websites. So I've got the links there. You will receive um, all the information to review this as much as you want post-webinar. Well, thank you very much, Janet. Uh, I'll, once again, I'll thank Chris for uh, her presentation today, and uh, we'll be signing off. Thank you. Okay. Just, to, just as a note, um, as we exit the webinar, your screen will populate with a survey. If you could just take a moment to fill out uh, the four brief questions, that would really help us to become better. So thank you again, and have a great day.